this reasoning, is it possible that you are given reasoning by someone who has reasoned poorly? Is that possible? Yes. yes. Okay. And, and then that person has a conclusion that flows from this problematic reasoning, right? Talking it. Because you've got to slow down and see this. Do you get some arguments are poorly constructed? Yes. And they're not persuasive? Yes? yes? And then that person who's presented you with a poorly constructed, unpersuasive set of reasons says, and this conclusion occurred. When you defeat the reasoning, yeah, we all agree we would defeat the reasoning. We would go right here and we would point out, right, this inference is problematic. You with me? You come right back here and you say, well, you just don't get to say somebody's wrong. You now have to say, oh, here's why you're wrong. Here's what I disagree with. If you defeat a person's reasoning, do you defeat that person's conclusion? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Almost brings a tear to my eye. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it's really cool stuff because of course that's what you should do. Of course that's. that's what nature tells you. Okay. <clears throat> when you defeat somebody's reasoning, let me ask it this way, is it, is it, are you more confident that you've defeated their reasoning, or are you more confident that you've defeated their conclusion? Defeated their conclusion. Let's try it again. Somebody gives you reasoning, right? You, you go in here, right, and you say, because you're, you're walking back, nobody's a denier now, right? You actually now have to walk back with this person and say, here's my, my, here's what I'm struggling with in your argument. And it may be an inference that just doesn't flow. It may be, hey, Chuckles, like you've left out some really important stuff. Like if you're gonna say that, if you're gonna say uh, global warming is a reality and it's caused by fossil fuels, don't you also then have to say, if you're saying it's caused by fossil fuels, don't you have to say it's not caused by anything else? Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then don't you have to disprove the impact of urbanization? Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but if there's nothing in your argument about the effect of urbanization, you get, I'm going to bring you back in here, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yes? Yeah. And would you agree with me that if you have not studied the effect of urbanization on climate, you might want to do that. Talk to me. Yeah. Go figure. So, <clears throat> if you don't do that, does that mean? So now I pointed this out, right? So this person's come and said, "This, this is my, this is my argument." They give me the argument. I point out a, what I consider to be a really substantial hole here, right? And that person says, "Well, I still, my position still is fossil fuels." have caused climate change. Could it be correct that fossil fuels has caused climate change? Yes. But I've defeated the reasoning I was given. Oh, son of a bitch, don't you hate when that happens? You mean you could still be right? <sighs> but think what's happening, right? You, again, this is just, when you defeat somebody's reasoning, you defeat somebody. Your conclusion is, I have defeated your reasoning. You with me? Mm -hmm. Not, I have defeated your conclusion. Because you could be right for the wrong reasons. I mean, you, you may be right. Your conclusion may be, may be correct. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm saying your conclusion is not well reasoned, yes? I'm not saying your conclusion is wrong, because if I say the conclusion is wrong, don't I have to disprove it? But I don't disprove it by pointing out that you'll look something. I don't disprove it. I weaken it, yes? but I don't disprove it. So what's the part about this? That'll be on your test, I guarantee you it's on your test, because the test, I mean, hello, right? So when you're working in the world of flaws, you know, and, and you don't get to ignore my reasoning. They can have it so that my reasoning is for whatever, say I'm coming to the conclusion that uh, additional monies, expenditures, should be uh, allocated to secondary education. 
and then the other party comes in. And then I give you my reasoning, right? So I'm, I'm here, right? I'm gonna, the conclusion I'm going to draw is that additional expenditures should be allocated to secondary education. And here's my reasoning, right? And then the other person comes along and says, <coughs> I disagree. I believe additional expenditures should be allocated to the military. And then they give me all their reasoning. What's wrong with that? You got it. You got it. You got it. You have an obligation to, to count to, to provide a counter position. Is to provide a counter position. You can you can certainly do that, but that doesn't defeat my position. If you're going to defeat the, if you're going to say, uh, if I'm going to say additional resources ought to be allocated to secondary education, and you say I disagree. I want to know what you disagree about because I just gave you my evidence, right? And you don't cite any of my evidence. You just come along and say, bullshit, you know, we should give it to the military. Okay. And you may make an affirmative argument for that, but what does that got to do with the argument I made? So to be non responsive, and again, everything here has a level of difficulty. You with me? So it's from level one to level five. Level one, you can expect something like the person who, you know, the, uh, uh, the movie producer who will make money if the film is successful, right? And then makes an argument that the film uh, is, has a lot of integrity. So when you see that, if it's a flaw issue, the flaw is going to be that the film can have integrity even, even though the person producing it's going to make money. Right? And, 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 and so that's going to be like a level one. Level fours and fives, I think, are much more likely to be in here. Because it's, it's a, do you see how om almost everybody had the wrong first answer when we started this? You with me? So if you're not prepared, and then it's not much of a journey to get it right, it's just stop. So, oh, oh no, I can't. That's not how I'm supposed to think. Yeah, that's right. So here, you're heavily, t and doesn't it make sense? You want people to pay you to read. Them. That's it. That's what I do. I'm pretty good at it. You know? But, but you don't have to write the science to be good at it. So, <clears throat> so flaws, they're like buckets they have up there. So one is, you know, you got to respond to an argument. You got to respond to the reasoning, right? Um, the other is, okay, correlation, causation. How about I love them. Oh. How about the difference between things that are necessary for an argument, things that are necessary in here, as opposed to sufficiency, right? You are, you are, and again, to think this is not related to law, to somehow make this Aristotelian logic, it's just bullshit. It's, there's, no, there's no attorney on the planet that's not aware of when he or she has more work to do, as opposed to when he or she is done, right? So, in here, a necessary condition, right, is something that if you took it out of your reasoning, right, if you took it out, that conclusion would collapse. It would collapse. It's like trying to, what did I make? I can't pronounce it because it had a French name, beef bouillon or something. It was good. It was good. I made that for dinner uh, last night. It was really good. But would it be fair to say if I'm going to make beef, whatever, it's like B O. You ever know how to say that? Bouillon. Like, uh, how? It's like bouillon. Bouillon, is that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, but I, I think if you just get like down to earth on this stuff, right? Because I mean, I could be talking about trying a case, and we do that way. But if I'm going to make beef bouillon, would it be fair to say a necessary addition is the bloody beef? <laughs> yes? But doesn't the bouillon like add other stuff? Whatever that, yeah, I'm going to practice my French. <laughs> but stop and think about it. So a, a necessary condition is, is something that's in your reasoning, right? It got to be there. It's it not optional. It's just not optional, right? 
uh, I use pearl onions. Pearl onions are part of the recipe I use. So let's stipulate that my recipe is the recipe, right, which I got from somebody else, of course. Would it be fair to say then, in my beef bouillon, you have to have pearl onions? Yes, in your beef bouillon. Right? Okay. And, and, and then I say to you, well, I had pearl onions and therefore I had beef bouillon. That's going to be on your test. It's a beautiful thing. It's not complicated. Do you get it? A nestle. So because you deal with these abstract terms and then you can get lost, right? Which again was, to me, law school's terrific because it really is by example working your way up. Um, does everybody get that in, in, in not all arguments, some arguments have nothing that's necessary. Some arguments are there is no single fact that has to be there. Everything is permissive. You get a fact can be permissive, a fact can be required, yes? Okay. So that word required is a synonym for the word necessary. A third synonym is the word depends. So when you see, and you're reading an argument, right, and the writer has used the word depends, well, if the argument depends on it, doesn't my beef bouillon recipe depend on the pearl onions? Talk to me. Yes. Doesn't it require the pearl onions? Yes. Doesn't it, isn't it, uh, it, it, and it, it, okay, so, so you get it, yes? So necessity is, you gotta have it. If you're missing it, you got, you're going nowhere, you with me? Your conclusion is just blown to hell. Right. But the mere fact that you've had it doesn't ensure that the conclusion you've drawn is correct. Yeah, talk to me. Mm -hmm. So you're going to test on this. Right? And it just, oh, so what am I looking for? The word depends, the word requires, the word necessary. When I see that language, it I want to say invariably, because I don't think there are exceptions, that that's going to say the writer is now focusing your attention to a necessary condition. Wouldn't that give you an advantage over the person sitting next to you if the person sitting next to you hasn't really thought this out? Mm -hmm. And you're getting tested on the principle. So the, the, it's not about what you're reading, right? It's about what it represents. Okay. So we get necessity, yes? Mm -hmm. Sufficiency. Sufficiency means I get to sit down. I'm done. So in my hypothetical of the of the beef bouillon recipe, sufficiency would, would be when each and every ingredient required to be there had been had been used. You with me? So so as I'm making it and uh, I'm putting in all the different ingredients. All the different ingredients that I'm using are necessary for my recipe. They may not be necessary for somebody else's recipe, right? But for mine, it would be necessary. But at some point, I reach sufficiency. And that's when I got it. It's all that. Sufficiency is when we sat down and eat. Right. Doesn't mean it's good, doesn't mean it's not good, but it means nothing else is required. So on the test, you get that people can conflate or confuse necessary conditions with sufficient conditions. And, and here's how they're going to do it. <coughs> now you read the, the issue, and the issue is it's flawed, right? So it's flawed, you with me? You're, you're not looking to read it and say, oh, that makes sense. It's flawed, Chuck. So if I read, so I'm going to flaw here. The flaw, if you tell me what the flaw is. To, to operate effectively, uh, this antenna needs to be built of a certain material at a certain height and at a certain location, period. Yes? I was in the area yesterday, and I found the antenna has been completed. And I examined it, and the antenna is 
of the required material at the specified height and at the desired location. And therefore, the antenna will work effectively. Doesn't that sound like a valid argument? Talk to me. Yes. Yeah. Right. And didn't it sound valid when we first started with the, you know, if you defeat the reasoning, then you defeat the conclusion. Talk to me. Mm -hmm. It really is just slow enough. It's not a valid argument. Anybody tell me why? Oh, why it's... Why it's not valid? Oh, because there could be other <coughs> required um, things that it needs to be able to operate. And if, if the writer, did the writer have a tool available to herself or himself that would have excluded that possibility? Is there a word the writer could have used that would have taken the ambiguity away? If you um, get this one, you're going to scare me. Um, I don't know. The, these things are, are necessary, but you, not ex yeah, you, you're yeah. close. Just like the exclusive or only material. Oh, the O word. Oh, oh. Who controls the language? The writer. Son of a bitch. And it's a law school admissions test. So if I had wanted to communicate sufficiency to you, what would have prevented me from writing to operate effectively? This antenna needs to meet only three conditions, A, B, and C. Visited the place, the antenna meets each of the three conditions, and therefore, it will work effectively. And according to that argument, it will work effectively. And that would be an argument that is not flawed. So think about, it's the word only. Now, it's not exclusive, there are other <coughs> words that could be used, but you get the writer is writing with precision. Talk to me. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just changing the way you read. You're just going to read. So when I say read textually, you get all I mean by reading textually is you're now aware that in the absence of the word only, I know what I was led to believe, right? You get it's like a setup, right? And if you're not prepared, you walk right into the trap. And you don't have a clue. When you come out of the test thinking you got a 180. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating task. Because, again, this is what we do. Words are our lives. Uh, so, on that note of sufficiency, there are two different um, applications. Could it be the case that any given outcome needs uh, multiple necessary conditions. Like if we're talking about human life, if we're going to say human life exists, would it be fair to say there's not just one condition that is required? There are multiple conditions. Talk to me. Are we good? Okay. So when we're dealing with multiple conditions, then and you're you're looking at sufficiency, you've got to be told this is the, these are the only conditions they have. That that's all they require, and then you're fine. Right? Um, but are there outcomes that don't require multiple conditions? Are there outcomes that require just one condition? Well, now to stop, to stop. Because now I can test you on necessity and sufficiency in two different worlds. One world where you need a bunch of them, right? So that's, that's my dinner. But how about this? We flip it, kind of, I think, when we say, well, would it be fair to say, if you were, uh, would it be fair to say somebody could write, uh, that could write a, a sentence that says, uh, if it snows, I would catch a chill. Talk to me. Could, yes. could, yes. could such a thing be written? Yes. And under that fact, would you need would you need anything else to catch a chill? In other words, you have this you have this remember it's a fact, right? So they're giving you as an everything is an established fact, right? So you don't get to argue with it. You don't get to say, well, no, because I could have been wearing an overcoat. You with me? Mm -hmm. Or no, because I could be indoors when it's snowing. Do you get but that's what some people are gonna do. They're gonna start arguing with it, right? 
and they're not going to go to law school because they don't understand that you're not here to argue with it, you're here to read it. So, if it snows, I'll catch a ship. What's going to happen if it snows? Does everybody agree? Mm -hmm. When you're not trying to overthink it and you're not saying, oh, you know, what's the contrapositive and all that? Bullshit. Right? Just keep it simple. Right? When a statement says, if it snows, I'm going to catch a chill, I am now am quite confident that <clears throat> if it snows, I will catch a chill. Yes? Yes. Do I need anything else to catch a chill? Under that fact pattern, do I need just do I need anything else to catch a chip? No. Oh. So is it fair to say that the statement, if it snows, I will catch a chew, <laughs> that I will catch a cold, is it fair to say that cites a sufficient condition? Maybe sufficient seems you're done. <coughs> so what's gonna happen if it snows? Catch a chill. So with respect to catching a chill, is it fair to say that a sufficient condition is it snows? Talk to me. Yes. yes. Right? If it rains, I'll get wet. What's going to happen if it rains? Do, you get do, do I need anything else? No. So do you get. Now, you notice what changed is this was posed as an if then. Because that stands for principle. So insufficiency, now, let, let's take this. If it's not, if it, let's see, if it's not, I'll catch a chip. Is it fair to say we now know what will happen when it snows? Talk to me. Yes. Yes. Did I give you any information with respect to when the sun is out? No. no. So is it fair to say you have no guidance as to whether or not you're going to get a chill or not? If I say when the sun's out, do you have a clue whether you're going to catch a chill or not? No. Uh oh. Well, no, wait a minute. But chill, that's the conclusion. I was going to catch a chill when it snows. But you're saying, aren't you now saying there are other ways I could catch a chill? In other words, doesn't that argument, doesn't the wording of the argument permit? Maybe you would catch a chill because you opened up a refrigerator. Uh, maybe you, in other words, were you given any guidance about opening up a refrigerator? No. No, no you were given <coughs> simple guidance about if it rains, that's it, nothing else, yes? So your reasoning is restricted by facts. The only thing you know is that if it rains, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch a chill. Doesn't that wording leave open the possibility that there are an infinite number of other ways you could catch a chip. Yes. And they can be nonsensical. Uh, if it's uh, 112 degrees, could you catch a chill? According to the first argument, if it's 112 degrees, could you catch a chip? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes, again, you've got to take out, pretend you never went to school. It'd be so much easier. I didn't really show much in school when I was there, you know, so it's easy for me. But, but if you think of it, the if is the law. The if is the law. You say, if it rains, if it snows, the if gives you the law. When the law is not present, you have no guidance. So in the absence of that, now, gosh, who controls the language? So if, if I wanted to say, like, all right, so you get in the original if then, right? If it snows, I'll catch a chill. That what we have cited is a condition that is sufficient to catch a chill, but not necessary to catch a chill. Talk to me. Yes. You're, you're tested through the gazoo on this, right? And it's just not a big deal if you slow down. But you all get it conceptually. Um, <coughs> How would I change it if you were the writer and what you wanted to communicate to the reader is there was no other way you were going to catch a chill. You with me? There is there's no, this is it, there is no other way in the world you can catch a chill. What language would you have available to you that's different from if this, then that? What if? Hmm? 
Well, when is the same? You say, well, when when it uh, when it snows, I'll catch a chill. That's not giving me any guidance about when it's not. You will catch a cold when it snows. I'm sorry. You will catch a cold when it snows. Well, okay, but couldn't I catch a chill when it's not? That's only giving me guidance about when it snows. Only when it snows. You're very close. I'm not only. If I catch a cold, it must be snowing. But wouldn't that wouldn't that wouldn't preclude if it's warm outside, no. right? I will only catch a chill if it's snowing. Yeah, and you're both hitting the same that word only. I was gonna say if and only if it snows, I'll catch a chill. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the more precise rendition, but you're all on it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Think about it, think about it. <coughs> again. We're paid by our clients to use language on their behalf, right? Uh, it's no big deal. It's so not a big deal. Um, but it takes adjustment. So sure, you get the difference between, so I don't know like who's trying to explain this in formal logic, but I would just get confused. But if you say, if then, oh, okay. Well, then you've given me a description when the if occurs. Okay, you haven't told me anything in the event the if doesn't occur. But you change that and you say, if and only if it snows, will I catch a chill? Or you can put it in the middle, right? I will catch a chill if and only if it rains, but it snows. Do you get how the language of the writer alters the outcome? So. That would be to say, if, if we use that, that, that statement, if and only if it snows, I will catch a chill. Yep. Is that a necessary condition, a sufficient condition, or both? In order to catch a chill. If and only if it snows. Both. Both. It's both. <clears throat> Right, because you're saying you, you have to have it, right? And further than you're saying nothing else can bring it about. Do you get? So again, this is, and it's, it's right out of law school. It's what I'm saying is these are the principles you're being tested on. Now, these are the principles within the school of flaws, right? So there's going to be a school of assumptions, a school of weakening and strengthening an argument, right? There's like different classes you're going into. They're stuck. I, I promise you, they're stuck. They can't change a damn thing on this test. They don't want to change a damn thing on this test. They want to see if you can reason the way we're taught to reason. What's so hard about this? I, I, you know, again, I, I'm not been. So that's there. So now you're looking. So in your the way to prepare for this, right? It's just to reflect on this stuff. Reflect on uh, the if-then statement. And yes, we can go in the flaw, yes, in the flaw, in the issue of flaws, they will move to, to test your understanding that, you know, if it snows, I'll catch a chill, does not mean if I catch a chill, it had to snow. Do you get that? Because again, that stands for general proposition, which is now you can get into that formal logic stuff. You can you make this sound fancy. And, Start talking about the uh, affirmance of the, you know, the the affirmance of the antecedent, the denial, of the consequence. You but you don't need any of that stuff. Do you get? If it snows, I'll catch a chill. But based, building on the conversation we just had, that statement allows you to catch a chill in any number of ways. Yes. So then you can't say, if I catch a chill, it, sn it snowed. Well, it may have snowed, but that's not. You didn't say it may have snowed. You said it was may have snowed. It'd be fine. Yes. So, when you have an if-then, and if they're testing you for a flaw, right, then they can do that. They can, they can say, well, yeah, you know, if this, then that, and then they say the then occurred, right? Well, that doesn't mean the if occurred, because an if-then allows multiple thens to occur. Uh, nor, if you say, if it, <coughs> if it snowed, I, I, I'll catch a chill, well, Next sentence is, it didn't snow. So you get a bunch of people are going to say, so I didn't catch a chill. 
they're wrong. But but that's what, if you were just knee-jerk, and you said, well, wait a minute, you just said, if it snows, I'm going to catch a chill. And then you said to me, it didn't snow. So I didn't catch a chill. That's why we have the word chuckles in our vocabulary. Right? Because that is incorrect. You, I don't know whether you caught a chill or not. All I know is it didn't snow. Yes, talk to me. Yes, sir. You know, and then the final thing, and, but this is valid, so they don't test you on it. But the, the, the final proposition is, you know, if you say, well, if it snows, I catch a chill, and then you say, well, I didn't catch a chill. Well, I, I don't know about you, but in the Bronx, I'm kind of thinking that means it didn't snow. Yes? If it snows, I'll catch a chill, right? And then a person comes in and says, son of a bitch, I didn't catch a chill. What didn't it do? It snowed. No, because if it snowed, what would you have done? Have a chill. So what's, what's the heavy lift here? Uh, so just again, flaws, you won, how are they presented, right? And that's with one of those four words, the word flaw, the word error, the word questionable, the word vulnerable. Marry with the word reasoning or the word argument, argument, and constant reasoning. Every time that shows up, that's flaw. Every time you see a flaw, the writer has embedded a, uh, you're being presented with a hypothetical, and the hypothetical is an example of a broader principle, right? And that's what they're testing you on. So you get it, get it's going to be a recognition test. Now, flaws are fatal. Does someone want to call security? I, mean, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> but I got, I guess, he comes close. I can spray him. <laughs> That's Jen. He, he's, uh... But let me let finish this off. Um, so you're going to start with, do I recognize the issue? Right. And there are no exceptions. Now, the laws are fatal. You with me? They're fatal. They don't injure an argument. They, obliterate an argument. So stop and now think about that, right? <clears throat> and this thing of time. If they're going to test you on, I mean, it's possible you, you could read an argument where there was a survey done, right? And the survey relied on an unrepresentative sample. Now, you will be tested, generally speaking, you are tested on the difference between an unrepresentative sample, in this world of flaws, and an underrepresentative sample. You get <clears throat> the sample is unrepresentative. If you want to, uh, if you want to make a case about, uh, if you want to claim that pizza in New York City is the best pizza in the planet, okay. And your evidence refers solely to pizza in Queens. Would it be fair to say? your sample is inadequate because there's going to be pizza in the other four boroughs. Yes, sir. So merely telling me what the quality of pizza is in one of the five boroughs is going to be an underrepresentative sample, unless that borough constitutes 98% of the city. Yes? Right. Okay. So underrepresented samples, are either, either that's going to be there, or the sample is going to be unrepresentative. Right? So an unrepresentative sample is, you went to the wrong group. You know, you're, 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 you're looking for uh, what course of treatment will you be seeking for an illness? And you, you've, uh, you've asked Derek Jeter. You know, you've, got, you've gone to some very famous baseball players, right? And you're asking them for uh, advice on the course of a medical treatment. Would it be fair to say that absent some, ex some extraordinary circumstances, that would not be the group you would go to for guidance in this area? Talk to me. Yeah. So where's Aristotle? So, so that's what the writer is doing. The writer is starting up here with an abstraction, creating a situation, which is the hypothetical of the example you're reading, tethered to the principle. Right. Laws are fatal. So while it's theoretically possible, the writer could present you an argument where both there was an unrepresentative sample and an error 
in the, uh, we have a conclusion in causation, right? But we have reasoning in correlation. So that argument theoretically now has two fatal defects in it. Yes, talk to me. Yeah. But when you get to the answer choice, and that's very, very rare. I'm not even sure I can think of an example of that, right? But when you get to the answer choices, if the flaw is fatal, how many choices can they present you with? One. One. Cabbage. So even if they put two fatal defects in there, since the flaw itself is fatal, they can only test you on one. So if you're reading it right, and you're saying, no, 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 uh, it's unrepresentative, right? And, and this person's conflating uh, correlation with causation. And answer choice A says, you're conflating correlation with causation. What's the answer? That's where you whack the mole. You with me? Right? The person who's going to run out of time sitting next to you after reading A does what? Oh, well, that, that's, that's precious, yes. And then after reading A again, reads what? A. Well, the rest of the answer. How about B, C, D, and A? Yeah. yeah. Do you get, do you want to be, you still want to be lawyers? Go figure. Well then, again, and not, not to, uh, we're paid to make decisions. We're paid to, uh, we, we can't procrastinate forever. And on a time sensitive test, you get, you're going to be rewarded, one, if you can identify issues where there can only be one answer choice, yes? Right. And two, do you now, are you now thinking like a lawyer instead of a college student? Whereas a college student, you're going to read everything, you're going to double check everything, right? That would be just a plotter, right? But the plotter's going to run out of what? Time. Yeah. And that's why when you view this as a college student and you're looking at the test, what do you feel you don't have? Time. But your lens is the lens of a college student. Well, you're a lawyer now. You have plenty of time. It's the person next to you that doesn't have the time. And that, again, that feeds high self-esteem, that feeds attitude, that feeds motivation, and that's where, and again, you've got to be able to do it. But being able to do it is not sufficient. Right? That, that <clears throat> you have to have the psychology as well as the ability. Does that make sense? Are you guys saying yes to the LSAT? Mm -hmm. yeah. The LSAT, your friend? Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, as long as you're up to it, I'm inferring you're 